A very warm welcome to World 360. I'm Akanksha Swaroop. A viral video from India's Manipur has shaken the collective conscience of the world. What's making matters worse is the political blame game and state apathy. On the war front, Russia has exited the Grain Deal and South Africa has refused to host Vladimir Putin during the BRICS. And is an extramarital affair the reason behind China's missing foreign minister? We'll find out, but first up are the headlines. A viral video from the Indian state of Manipur showing dozens of men parading and assaulting two women who have been stripped naked triggers international outrage. Russia's exit from the Black Sea Grain Deal puts focus on Asia's food prices. A Republican senator has released an internal FBI document containing allegations that United States President Joe Biden and his son Hunter Biden accepted bribes from a Ukrainian firm. And India's UPI payment model reaches Sri Lanka as the two countries announce a new economic partnership during Sri Lanka's president Vikramasinghe's India visit. A horrific video emerged in India this week, one that shook the collective conscience of the world. It shows two naked women being paraded and molested by a mob, this in the violent hit Indian state of Manipur. This assault on women took place almost three months ago, but it became public only on Thursday after the video went viral. According to a police complaint, one of the women was even gang raped. The complaint adds that a third woman was also forced to strip, even though not seen in the video. As outrage and revulsion built over this attack, India's Supreme Court also reacted. So did India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi. And yet another ghastly revelation has emerged that the police were the ones who gave the two women away to the mob. This according to an account given by one of the victims in what's too little too late. Few accused have also been arrested, but truth hurts. That rape has long been used as a weapon during conflict, whether it's war or mob violence. Since time immemorial, women have been used as instruments for revenge. Huge scale of sexual violence has already emerged during the war in Ukraine. To give a few examples from South Asia, the 1947 partition of India, the 1971 Bangladesh independence war, the 1984 anti-Sikh riots, the civil war in Sri Lanka and the 2002 Gujarat riots. These are just few examples of conflicts that have reported sexual violence against women. But what can state's mechanism do to end such sexual violence in conflict-affected areas? Let's find out. And for that, let me introduce my guest today. I'm joined in by Mary Beth Sanate, who's a women's rights activist. And she's joining me live from Chura Chandpur. Um, let me also tell you that me, Mary has been associated with the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 as a speaker in the past as well. Mary, thank you for joining in. Now that the video has come to light, questions are being raised if there are many more other women who could have faced similar sexual violence. Could you throw more light on how women have been treated in Manipur during this violence? Is this also a result of failure of state machinery? Yes. There are many cases of sexual violence in the past and during this crisis in Manipur, Northeast India. Pamela Patan, CEDO member, has rightly stated, and I quote, most silenced and least condemned crimes. So the question here is, do women need a viral video clip of her suffering to be heard by an authority? This is very sad. There are Several other FIR files that remain unattended. One is a case of grain rape and murder of two tribal girls by opponent group on 5th May 2023. And another one is mentally challenged tribal women who was shot dead on broad daylight on 6th July this year. These are reported cases that are still in paper there must be many more unreported cases considering the present ethnic violence and stigma attached to sexual violence. And when you talk about violence against women in conflict-prone 
regions, the UN Security Council has adopted a series of resolution on women, peace and security for an institutional framework for conflict related to sexual violence. Could you throw more light on this framework? UNHCR Resolution 1325, which is adopted on 30th October 2000, aims at prevention, protection, participation, and promotion of women peace and security in conflict and in post-conflict situations. Mary Beth, can government at the center borrow preventive and responsive measures from UN peacekeeping missions that protect the rights of women and children, especially in these conflict-prone areas. India has ratified the framework under CEDO Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Under Recommendation 30, it's also known as GR30. However, framework needs proper examination and execution for effective enforcement in conflict zones. Therefore, India at the center do not necessarily need to borrow a UN peacekeeping mission as the framework has already been adopted. However, as mentioned earlier, there are gaps and challenges of effective implementation mechanism of the framework in the ground gaps and challenges such as implementation strategy, effective monitoring, and minimal budget allocation makes it unaccessible for those women in need of such policy and framework. All right, Mary Beth Sanape, it was a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you for sharing those inputs. Stay safe. And with that, let me shift focus over to the war in Ukraine. Now, last year in July of 2022, warring nations Russia and Ukraine had signed a deal to allow vital grain exports from Ukraine and Black Sea ports. This in order to ease the global food crisis that was made worse by the war. But Russia has now exited this deal, meaning that food prices in Asia are expected to rise further. The Kremlin has said that its conditions for extending the deal had not been fulfilled. And now turning to the intel that has also come in from the British intelligence agency, the MI6 chief Richard Moore. He said that Vladimir Putin cut a deal with the Wagner chief, Prigozhin. Moore also said that Putin probably felt under pressure due to the fact that Prigozhin was his creature created by Putin himself, who then turned on him. Now, the US CIA director, William Burns, has also weighed in to the Russian mutiny with one significant statement that Putin is someone who thinks that revenge is a dish best served cold and that he will be surprised if Prigozhin escaped further retribution. Meanwhile, due to the arrest warrant on Putin by the International Criminal Court, Putin has agreed not to attend the BRICS summit in Johannesburg next month. He is expected to be the only leader of a country in the bloc not to be attending, though reports do indicate that he may make a digital presence. And on that note, let me also introduce my guests. I'm joined in by Lester Munson, who is a senior fellow at the National Security Institute. I'm also joined in by Edward P. Joseph, who is a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute. Let me first go to Lester. Lester, let's talk about Turkey's role. Now, Turkey's President Erdogan said that Russia wants to continue the agreement and that they would discuss the renewal of the deal when they meet in person next month. Turkey and UN had jointly negotiated the de deal earlier. Can Erdogan help in renewing the deal this time around as well? Well, we'll see. I hope he can. Uh, I hope he doesn't wait until next month. It would be nice to see uh, some sort of compromise worked out in the next few hours, if not the next few days. Uh, so waiting until August, I think, would be a mistake where, where the prices of grain are already going up uh, on world markets. We're likely to see that continue until some sort of accommodation is made here. All right. And on that note, let me quickly go across to Edward. Edward, will Vladimir Putin's absence end possibilities to find a currency that could rival the US dollar through the BRICS summit? What happens to the plans of de-dollarization now? Yes, this, this uh, damages very much the ambitions for the uh, BRICS summit. You don't have Putin there in, in person. 
uh, that uh, presence, that economy. This is, a, uh, unfortunately, for the Russian people, uh, this is an economy that has, is undeveloped, that relies almost entirely on fossil fuels uh, under, under Putin, who's failed miserably to develop his country's economy. Uh, and so that economy, that, uh, th that aspect of uh, fossil fuel support for whatever it is the BRICs want to do in terms of developing some kind of alternative currency, however uh, unrealistic that actually is, that's now very much compromised here. And, and the, again, if you're leader of one of these other countries, why would you want to be further invested hello, hello, hello. in uh, hello. A, a leader uh, of a country that's as problematic as Russia and, as, and a leader as problematic as Vladimir Putin? You're just bringing negativity on yourself. Now, of course, uh, some countries, for example, India, are in a position to exploit this and get uh, oil at lower cost uh, than otherwise. And in this situation, Prime Minister Modi and others can exploit Putin's weakness even more and ask for even more favorable terms, seeing how weak of a leader he is. So that's that's the reality here. Please. All right. Many thanks to you, Edward and Lester, for joining in with your precious inputs. And with that, let me now shift focus over to the United States. There are strong indications that the former U.S. President Donald Trump could soon be indicted. This in a third case. This one is with regards to special counsel Jack Smith's probe into efforts that were made to overturn the 2020 election. On Thursday, Trump's aide Will Russell testified to the grand jury investigating the 2020 election aftermath. This including the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. Remember, in the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case, Smith brought charges against Trump and his close aide, Walt Nota, last month as well. Trump also was indicted in late March by a Manhattan grand jury in connection with an alleged hush money payment that involved an adult entertainer, Stormy Daniels. And for that, let me now bring in my guest. I'm joined in by Ray Locker, who's a senior journalist. I'm also joined in by Joseph Tully, who's a criminal defense attorney. Before I go to Joseph, let me quickly take my question from Ray. Ray, wouldn't January 6 be much harder to prove than Donald Trump's mishandling of the government documents? I would say on the surface, yes. He had the documents. He's not allowed to have the documents. He hid the documents. He had multiple chances to turn the documents back in, and he refused to do so. That's all very clear cut. Many people have testified about that. There's really little doubt that he kept the documents he's not allowed to have. And his explanations have changed repeatedly, and none of them make sense. Let's quickly go across to Joseph Tully. Joseph, is there anything that stops Donald Trump from running for presidency, even if he does manage to go to prison? What does the U.S. Constitution say? Correct. There's nothing in the Constitution that would prevent Donald Trump from running for president, even if he uh, goes into prison. So, uh, again, here, really, his only uh, option is go, go to prison for life or run for president and win. If he wins, he could simply pardon himself and all of this goes away. Um, all right, Ray is back with us. Ray, what will this mean for Republican rivals of Donald Trump? I'm sure many of them would be having a field day. Well, I think it gives energy to Chris Christie because he's the only guy who's had the nerve to say anything about Trump. And I mean, his message and among other former Trump cabinet officials like Attorney General William Barr, uh, Defense Secretary Jim Mattis, all these people who left, John Kelly as former chief of staff and Homeland Security Secretary, they've all called him out and said that he was a disaster. This will be more people doing so. Plus, you have Republicans like Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, who were on the January 6th committee, and this will give them more ammunition for what they have discovered through their investigation. So the chorus of Republicans who are speaking out against Trump will only grow. Unfortunately, that's not growing among the people who are running against him for the Republican nomination. Many thanks to you, Ray Locker and Joseph Tully, for joining in with your precious inputs. And with that, I bring you the latest coming in from China. Chin Gang, one of the youngest appointees to the post of foreign minister in China's history, has gone missing. 
the disappearance has been lengthy and furious speculations have already begun to surround the minister's well-being, adding on to China's secrecy. The 57-year-old diplomat has not been seen in public for over 27 days, with his last engagements concluding on 25th of June. One of the best-known faces of the Chinese government, Mr. Chin's prolonged absence has not only been scrutinized by diplomats and China watchers, but also ordinary Chinese people. Moreover, the disappearance is all the more surprising, provided his proximity with Chinese President Xi Jinping. One of the most widely shared theories online is that Chin Gang is being investigated over an alleged extramarital affair with a TV show host named Fu Xiaotian and having a child out of wedlock. However, the foreign ministry has said that there remains no information on this matter that can be publicly shared. And with that, I slip into a quick break. Don't go anywhere because I'll be bringing you all the latest from across the world. Stay tuned to World 360.